Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Platter Museum for our fourth in a series of five lectures for the Whitehall Lecture Series this year. This is our 28th year of doing the lecture series. My name is John Blades. I'm the director of the Platter Museum. It's a pleasure to see you all here this afternoon. I'm going to take just a minute to thank the museum staff for the hard work that goes into putting together this lecture series. And I know that might be hard to imagine in the Historic House Museum. The irony is the, the better job we do, the easier it looks. But to give you a sense of how much goes on here behind the scenes, I thought I'd just give you a look at what this room looked like about 12 hours ago. <laughs> we did a, a, a major gala last night that took up the entire house, essentially. And that's just a show of this room. So to have the staff turn that around and get it ready for a lecture series today, I think is a no small accomplishment. And there's a few of us who are right now. We couldn't do this kind of programming without great sponsors, and Max and Victoria Drex Foundation are lead sponsors this year for the White Hall Lecture Series, and the Palm Beach Post uh, is also a long-term sponsor of the museum's programs. In fact, speaking of programs, we have in the back of the room uh, season program guides. You might want to pick one of those up. Just a great guide to the various kinds of programming that can happen here, here during, or throughout the season, uh, throughout the year, I should say, uh, concentrated mostly in the season. Our uh, theme this year is the presence of the Gilded Age, and by that I mean the presence of, we probably can't name most of us, we were joking about this over lunch, 1% of people might be able to name the presidents between Lincoln and uh, FDR, perhaps. <laughs> um, but these are presidents uh, were interesting, all of them very interesting, I think, in that they were struggling with a number of things, including how to manage an economy switching gears from uh, ag agrarian economy to a capitalist economy and all of the challenges that go along with that. And so we decided to focus uh, the lecture series this year on those presidents, those less known presidents. Today's lecture will be on Grover Cleveland, and um, a lot of interesting connections there. Uh, you're going to hear about his secret operation on board the Oneida. Those of you who are real flagger historians will recognize the name of that boat because a few years before Grover Cleveland's um, uh, emergency surgery aboard that boat, uh, Flagler's daughter died aboard that boat in childbirth. Um, and Flagler lost seven of his three children uh, through that uh, event. Um, she, by the way, Flagler's daughter, Jenny, Jenny Louise, was married to Elias Cornelius Benedict's son, Frederick Hart Benedict. Benedict, uh, Benedict excuse me, and that's how she happened to be aboard the boat off the coast of North Carolina. We've got the best person in the world to talk about this uh, secret surgery, Matthew Algio. Uh, and I should say, by the way, Matthew gets the award for coming the farthest of the lecture series. He actually lives in Outer Mongolia. <laughs> no, I think I'm joking, but I'm not joking. Um, we caught him like we had a short trip to the US for uh, the birth of his uh, first child, his daughter, um, Zaya. Zaya. Z-A-Y-A. So he and his wife Allison happened to be here in the States for a couple of months for the birth of their first child. And they went back to Mongolia, out of what was formerly known as Outer Mongolia, a long way from Palm Beach. Um, so uh, Matthew is a award-winning author. He's uh, very interested in history. He's written a couple of books that we find very interesting. He's actually just finishing up a book that I can't wait to read about. It's about the brief period of history when Walking was a sport when they would do marathon walks that would go on for a suspected sport, you can imagine. Walks for six days uh, before the advent of bicycle racing. Uh, and I can't wait to read that book. I'm really looking forward to that. But he's written other books like Harry Truman's Excellent Adventure about the cross country road trip that uh, Truman and his wife took after his presidency, and a number of other books as well. So. We have just the perfect person to enlighten us about Grover Cleveland and that secret sur surgery he had for the Oneida. So please join me in welcoming Matthew uh, Algeo to the White House uh, series, lecture series. Thank you. 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 Thank Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, where we live, and it was minus 20. <laughs> um, 
So I really came unprepared. I wore my heaviest wool jacket to Palm Beach. I didn't know it was going to be quite so warm. <laughs> Walking around in my jeans all day with my black shirt on. Uh, it's great to be here at the flag, although I have to say, I, I didn't get invited to this thing. <laughs> and I guess it could have been a miscommunication or something. But it looks like it was really a lot of fun. Uh, this is a fantastic museum. This house is amazing. And I was able yesterday to come and uh, walk around and do a tour. And, uh, it's a real treasure, um, not just for Palm Beach, but really for the entire country. I, I, I would encourage all my friends to, uh, to come and visit this place if you're interested in, in, in the Gilded Age at all, as I am very much. Uh, this is really a, a, a precious resource. Um, Rover Cleveland. What do most people know about Rover Cleveland? Non-consecutive terms, exactly. Grover Cleveland is the uh, president who screws up the, uh, uh, the counting of the presidents. He was the 22nd and 24th president. I remember when uh, uh, President Obama, in his first inauguration, the very first thing he said in his inaugural address was, 44 people have now taken this oath of office. And I was at parties with some friends and started saying, no, 43, because Grover counts twice, it's only 43 people have been president, not 44, but 44 presidents, but only four that people really didn't want to hear me talking about <laughs> at that particular moment. Um, there's, a, there's a good shot of Grover, huh? He was a big guy. He uh, was about six feet and got up to about 300 pounds. Um, I, I should probably have a Chris, Christie joke ready here. <laughs> I'm still working on the old notes, and I, I don't have that yet. Uh, he's the second heaviest president we ever had. Uh, Taft was... Uh, the uh, one president who was heavier than Grover. Uh, Grover got heavy because uh, when he was in Buffalo as a young man, he really enjoyed German food and German beer. And uh, that, for the rest of his life, was one, something that uh, he doubled in was his weight. And it was uh, difficult for him to control his weight. And it actually became an issue uh, with his health uh, throughout his presidency. He suffered from gout. And uh, as we'll see, he suffered from a, a cancer that may have been linked to some of his uh, habits, uh, the food that he ate and, uh, and the beer he drank. Grover was an interesting guy too because he really came from uh, from nowhere to become president. In 1880, uh, Garfield was uh, elected president, and in 1880, nobody in America had ever heard of Grover Cleveland. And just four years later, he was president. Uh, a couple things happened, and the, the stars really aligned for Grover on several occasions. Um, of course, Garfield, uh, and I think you have uh, uh, Ackerman, as you could hear talking about Garfield. Um, it, what was the turnout for him? It wasn't this big, was it? <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, uh, of course, Garfield got, gets shot up and dies, and, and Chester Arthur becomes president, and he doesn't run for re-election in 1884. In the meantime, uh, Grover was a bachelor lawyer in uh, Buffalo, lived in a rooming house, had a good law practice, but People didn't know very much about him. He wasn't well known outside his circle of friends in Buffalo. But uh, the city of Buffalo was looking for, uh, the Democratic Party was looking for a candidate to run for mayor of Buffalo in 1881. And the job didn't pay very much, and so really nobody else wanted to take it. Grover was single, he didn't have a family to support, and he'd saved a little money. So he basically volunteered to run on the Democratic ticket as the uh, candidate for mayor of Buffalo in 1881. And he won. And he quickly established himself as a uh, veto mayor. Uh, the government in Buffalo at that time was very corrupt. The city council was terribly corrupt. They had a, uh, as soon as uh, Grover became mayor, there was a street sweeping contract uh, that was awarded to the highest bidder, uh, <laughs> with the with the difference apparently to be shared among the members of the city council. And, and uh, Grover uh, vetoed this bill and vetoed many other bills that he considered uh, wasteful or impertinent. And uh, this quickly earned him a, a reputation in New York. And the following year, 1882, he was nominated to run for governor of New York. And he won. And he became the veto governor, uh, spending, uh, again, vetoing many wasteful spending bills. And this earned him a national reputation. Two years later, in 1884, he ran for president of the United States and won. So in 1881, he was elected mayor of Buffalo, 1882 governor. 84 president. So that was a pretty rapid rise in uh, American political history. The 1884 campaign uh, was, was really interesting. It was razor thin, the margin. Uh, during the campaign, it came out that Grover had fathered an illegitimate child. 
to us today, imagining a politician fathering a child out of wedlock is, of course, you know, not something that would never happen. <laughs> but even back then, it was a little, uh, you know, it wasn't what you wanted to do to advance your political career. But when the news broke that he had fathered a child out of wedlock, uh, Grover's response to his friends in Buffalo was, tell the truth. And he owned up to it. He had uh, supported the child and the mother. And uh, really, when the facts came out, it turned out to be not much of an issue in the, uh, in the campaign in the end. Grover won New York State by uh, about 1,000 votes out of more than a million cast. And so that's how close the election was in, in 1884. He became president, the first Democratic president uh, since the Civil War. Uh, he was a big man, as I mentioned. And, uh, and uh, when he moved to uh, Washington, uh, I, I should mention that the first time he ever went to Washington was for his inauguration as President of the United States. <clears throat> when he went to Washington, he took his uh, personal cook with him from the uh, governor's mansion in, uh, in uh, New York. He didn't want to have any highfalutin French meals um, when he was in Washington. He lived as a bachelor uh, the first few years of his uh, term. And then in 1886, he married Frances Folsom. Uh, this was a little unusual uh, relationship. Francis was the daughter of one of the Grover's law partners back in Buffalo. His, his law partner was Oscar Folsom. Oscar had been killed in a carriage accident and, and when, uh, when Francis was a very, very small child. And, and Grover had kind of acted as her uh, de facto guardian. Uh, she was, uh, when they married, she was 21 and he was 49. Um, so that was, what do you call that, a June? Anyway, it was a little weird. Uh, because, <laughs> not only because of the age difference, but because he had kind of been her guardian for, the, for all those years. But at some point, uh, the, the relationship, uh, as I put it delicately, blossomed into romance. And uh, in 1886, uh, they were married. And Frances became the youngest first lady in American history at 21. Uh, she was beloved. Um, she was really one of the most popular first ladies uh, in US history. Uh, it's interesting uh, that the um, Cleveland's had uh, five children all together. Um, I'm not sure here, actually, I'm not. That's the way. <laughs> Uh, you can see Grover didn't like reporters, didn't like the newspapers, and so he refused to have a photographer present for the wedding, which I think is a real shame. Um, there were some pretty good sketch uh, you know, artists from the, the weekly uh, news magazines, like Harper's Weekly, who did attend, and this was the sketch they had. Uh, the, the dress that uh, Francis wore, it's sported satin, they said it was so stiff that it actually stood up by itself when nobody was in it. And then Grover wore a tuxedo with the, the uh, white, uh, white bow tie there. They had uh, five children. That Grover, despite Francis, Francis was a great political asset for Grover. Um, but she wasn't enough to uh, help him win re election in 1888. Uh, in, 18, uh, uh, in 1888, Grover ran against Benjamin Harrison, a uh, Civil War general from Indiana. And although uh, Grover uh, won the popular vote, uh, he lost the electoral vote in 1888. Again, something that will never ever happen again. Um, <laughs> I guess, I guess the, the, the people in Florida probably get that joke better than me. Um, but uh, Grover did win the popular vote, lost the electoral vote, and so as they were leaving the White House on March 4th, back then the inaugurations were on March 4th, uh, Francis told the, the, head, the head servant at the White House, keep everything just the way it is. We'll be back in four years. And, and sure enough, they were. Uh, the, the, Harrison, uh, the Harrison presidency is kind of interesting, too. To, though just one term, I think four states came into the Union uh, while Harrison uh, was president. He also revitalized the US Navy. Um, his wife, though, died towards the end of his term, and his heart really wasn't in it for a second term. In fact. The uh, campaign then in, in 1892 was really one of the most low-key political campaigns. Basically, neither candidate really campaigned. They just sent surrogates out to give speeches. Uh, so Grover did win, uh, win a second term in 1892. Between terms, though, uh, this is what Grover was working on. Uh, here you see Grover, Francis, and baby Ruth. Ruth Cleveland uh, was born uh, 
um, uh, don't even do that. Anyway, between the two terms was Ruth Claiborne born. And uh, she was very famous. Uh, Baby Ruth is what the papers called her. And uh, this is this is where I always have to talk a little bit about the Baby Ruth candy bar, which claims, <laughs> claims that it named itself, that it was named after uh, uh, Baby Ruth Cleveland, although it's very interesting that Baby Ruth candy bar was introduced in 1921, just as Babe Ruth, the baseball player, was emerging uh, as a national hero. And, and by then, poor Baby Ruth, she got up to theory at 12, she was long dead. So it seems a rather unusual marketing strategy to name your new product after the long dead daughter of a long dead president. <laughs> but that was their story, and they've uh, stuck with it to this very day. Uh, they had five children in all. Their second child, Esther, was born in the White House itself in October of 1893. And uh, it's funny because Grover had, she was older uh, when he had, you know, later in life when he had children. And I, uh, I, went to a church I lived in Portland, Maine for a few years and attended a congregational church there. And, uh, I met a woman in church, her name was Margaret Cleveland, and I made a joke about Grover. And she said, well, actually, he's my grandfather. And Grover, it turns out, had a, had a son, Francis, in 1897, when he was 60. Grover was born in 1837. He had a son in 1897. And then the son had a, had a child when he was 60 in 1957. And so the grandkids, I'm, I have, I'm Facebook friends with two of Grover Cleveland's grandchildren. I mean, they're, they're in their 50s. It's, it's, it's really interesting. And I like, I like stories like that to show how close this history is to us. Um, and uh, John and I were talking earlier today about, you know, you have to be careful. You, you figure nobody cares what I write about Grover Cleveland. How am I going to slander? Well, you know, there's some grandkids out there that probably care what you say about Grover Cleveland. So uh, you have to be sensitive to that. As he began his second term in uh, 1893, Grover Cleveland faced uh, a lot of challenges. Um, that's Grover, uh, second term Grover, so this would be more, uh, yeah, 1892, 1893. I think this is a campaign picture for 1892. Um, this is the inauguration in 1893, March 4th, 1893. Uh, you, trust me, he's in there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> you can, no matter how far you blow it up, you can't really, can't really make him out. This is the way the pictures look back then. Uh, this is at the Capitol. Uh, it was a very cold day. Uh, it was not a very auspicious time to assume the presidency, 1893. Uh, there were a couple of things going on. Uh, number one, the economy was going down the drain. Uh, there was a, a speculative bubble in the United States in 1893, and it was railroads. And uh, like all bubbles, when it burst, it had a lot of negative repercussions uh, that reverberated throughout the economy. Just the week before Grover took the oath of office in 1893, the Reading Railroad went bankrupt. This was not a good sign. The Reading had been considered uh, one of the most stable railroads in, in the country and uh, had just opened a brand new terminal in Philadelphia the year before. But railroads had been hopelessly overbuilt. The country was expanding rapidly, of course, in this time. The population was growing. But the population, and I have the numbers in the book I, off the top of my head, I'll just generally say that from the end of the Civil War until 1890, the population of the U.S. might have grown by 70%, but the number of miles of railroad grew by 300%. And you'd have du duplicated lines, you know, going between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, two railroads just running the same track. And, and, and there was a lot of uh, overbuilding. And finally, the bubble burst in 1893. And of course, when the railroads went bankrupt, and something like 30 railroads went bankrupt in 93, they also brought down uh, numerous other businesses that depended on the railroads. Everything, uh, you know, from, from rope makers to uh, companies that made the ties for the railroad tracks. And it had a devastating effect on the economy. And this was just beginning as, as Grover took office in, in March of 1893. Another problem that was facing the country. And this, this became known as the Panic of 1893, this economic depression. It's still considered the second worst depression in US history uh, after the Great Depression. And almost no uh, you know, safety net as we know it today. Uh, the other problem uh, that the country was facing, an economic problem in 1893, was uh, the money question. And basically it boiled down to, should our money be based on gold 
or should it be based on silver? Now, I mean, this seems arcane to us today when our money is firmly based on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, where was I? Uh, but in 1893, money was, the money you owned, it, you, it was a gold certificate, it was worth the dollars worth of gold. And theoretically, you could go to the government and say, hey, I have a certificate, give me my gold. Uh, the ratio of gold to silver, and I, I don't want to get too, too into it, I write about it in the book and I'm still not sure I understand it. Um, the ratio of gold to silver was set by law at 16 to 1. So 16 ounces of silver equals one ounce of gold. A pound of silver equals an ounce of gold. And money was printed on this basis. And historically, that has been the ratio, that had been the ratio of, of gold and silver in, in the marketplace. Well, what happened was uh, a lot of silver got discovered in the 1870s and 1880s. The Comstock load was a big silver load. Big silver mines started opening up in western states, and as these states came into the Union, Nevada, uh, Montana, uh, they started clamoring for money to be backed by silver as well. And so they had enough political clout that they were able to pass through a, a, a bill that uh, required the Treasury to print, I think it was $4.5 million worth of uh, banknotes every month backed by silver. And this sent the economy out of whack. Basically, what it did is it flooded the country with money. Uh, and, and so you had a terrible inflation. Uh, of course, if, if you're in debt, uh, inflation is not so bad. The money you're paying your debts with is theoretically cheaper than the money you, you, you incurred the debts with. And so there was actually a lot of support for this in the country at the time. But Grover was not a silver guy. He was firmly a gold bug, as they were known. And he, had, he came, to, uh, came to office with the state in, intention of repealing this law, it's called the, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act, repealing this law that required the government to buy all this silver. And so those are kind of the conditions that, that Grover finds himself facing uh, when he goes to, uh, to take the oath of office in uh, March of 1893. Um, it was also around this time that Grover noticed a little bump on the roof of his mouth. It was on the uh, upper left side back by Mulder's back there. And with all else that was going on, he really didn't, didn't think too much about it. Uh, but it, it eventually became so bothersome to him, and, and this little sore, this bump on the roof of his mouth, uh, grew so large that it began to concern him, and he had his doctor, uh, a guy named Joseph Bryant, uh, his personal physician who lived in New York, came down to examine this bump. And uh, Brian uh, took one look at it and said it uh, looked like a bad tenant and it should be evicted immediately. It seemed that Grover had cancer. And cancer at the time, you have to remember, was really, uh, compared to kind of what AIDS was like in the 1980s, there was a stigma attached to cancer. Uh, General Grant, President Grant, had died less than 10 years before of a very, uh, very painful and public death from a moral cancer. He had a moral tumor. Uh, and, and cancer, the, the word itself is not even mentioned in newspapers. It was called the dread disease or the disease that no doctor dared name. Um, that's the stigma that was attached to cancer. And uh, so Grover decided to have an operation to remove this tumor from the roof of his mouth. But he would only consent to the operation if it was done in total secrecy. Uh, one of the reasons was because he wanted to avoid the stigma that was attached to cancer. Um, but there were other reasons as well. One of them was this guy. This is Adley Stevenson. He was Grover's vice president. Adley Stevenson is the grandfather of the future presidential candidate uh, who ran uh, Adley Stevenson in 52 and 56. But Adley Stevenson, the vice president in 1893, was a silver guy. He was on the complete opposite side of the most contentious political issue of the day from his president. This was not uncommon at the time at the conventions. You know, the presidents really didn't have much input of who their running mate was going to be. And so they just picked a guy who would balance out the ticket and stick him on it, and that was that. So Grover and Adley Stevenson didn't even really get along. Uh, barely saw each other while they were, uh, while they were uh, in office together. And so Grover was afraid that if Stevenson, a silver guy, found out that Grover, a gold guy, was, had cancer, 
that Stevenson might make some move to uh, sweep in and, and build up support for keeping uh, silver, uh, uh, this silver as a, as a monetary unit. And, and, and Grover was really, really afraid that there would be some conspiracy organized by his vice president, Adley Stevenson, if it came to be known he was sick. Grover was also worried that if it came to be known he was sick, that uh, Wall Street would panic, that would make things worse, the financial markets would utterly collapse. You know, as a gold person, uh, as, as a gold bug, uh, Cleveland had a lot of support on Wall Street. Uh, the banks were Cleveland, they were pro-Cleveland, and uh, industry was pro-Cleveland, and so Cleveland was afraid that they would lose, uh, you know, they would lose faith that there would be uh, a real panic in the country if it came to be known that he had the dread disease. And so they had to, uh, they had to have the, the operation in secret. Now, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to have a secret cancer operation that you don't want anybody to know about, where do you have it? A boat. Sure. What could go wrong? Uh, Cleveland had a friend, uh, as John was mentioning, uh, Elias Benedict, and he owned this lovely yacht called the Oneida. It wasn't very big, but it was a very graceful, a well-known yacht. And Grover had often gone on fishing trips with uh, Benedict on this yacht. And so uh, it was decided that they would perform the operation on the Oneida at sea under the cover of Cleveland being on a fishing trip. Um, a team of doctors uh, was recruited, uh, all sworn to secrecy, that these were really some of the best doctors in the country. Um, I should, that's Benedict. There's really no reason to show me except I love that beard. Uh, I actually had a, a, a copy of Commodore Benedict, apparently Commodore of his own private army. These guys were always calling themselves Commodore or something. But uh, I had somebody email me who, who liked the book, and uh, and he made a, a very interesting observation that, you know, there's so much conformity in the 1890s, in the Gilded Age, really, with, especially with men's dress. And the men all dress exactly the same, and that really the only expression of individuality is facial hair. And that's the one thing you see, like, the crazy facial hair. And Grover had his famous mustache. It was a big deal to Grover that whatever they did, they couldn't get rid of the mustache. Like, you couldn't imagine Grover Cleveland without his mustache. So that was one of the things they had to take into consideration. And I, I, do, I do think that's an interesting theory that uh, men's facial hair was really kind of their only expression, only way to express their, their individuality. There we go with another one. That's a pretty good theory, though. I don't know that one. That is William Keane. He is the main doctor. He was the most famous surgeon in America at the time. And he was the first doctor they recruited to help with this operation on Cleveland. And he had a lot of surgical experience. He was an interesting guy. He was a, uh, a devout Baptist who uh, firmly believed in evolution. I don't know what more to say about that. But, uh, but, but he really, he, he, was, he was the most famous doctor in America. And just imagine what he's agreeing to here, to secretly remove a tumor from a patient, probably the most important patient in the country, while on a moving boat. Uh, under, under, you know, below deck on the boat is where the operation would be performed. I mean, he was, uh, he was really, I, I learned the expression uh, when you were a deep doo-doo back then. Uh, <laughs> the expression was, up to the, up to the hub in mud. And, uh, and he must have known he'd be up to the hub in mud if anything went wrong on this operation. Uh, but a team was assembled, about five doctors in all agreed to take part in this operation. Uh, it, took part, it took place on the boat, the Oneida, July 1st, 1893. This is Grover City. This is not from that trip. This is from a couple years later. Um, yeah, spoiler alert, he lived. Uh, but this is from a couple years later, uh, Grover on the deck of the Oneida. And that's uh, Benedict standing to the right there. And uh, you see he's still a pretty hefty guy there. Um, the, uh, the operation was performed on July 1st. 1893, the ship sailed from uh, from uh, New York up to uh, uh, Cape Cod. Uh, the Clevelands had a summer home on Cape Cod. And while they were on Long Island Sound, in 90 minutes, the operation was performed. It was a very calm day, fortunately for them. Um, it, I don't know what would have happened if it hadn't been, whether they would have just circled until the water was calm or, or maybe gone to a, a to dock it somewhere. But the operation took place while the, while the boat was at sea. Uh, lasted 90 minutes. 
uh, about five, uh, well, five, five teeth, and about a third of the upper, upper left palate was removed in this operation. Uh, ether was the uh, was used as the anesthesia, um, so Cleveland was uh, anesthetized, uh, but we apparently woke at least once during the operation. Um, it was a very, very daring, uh, daring thing to do, and a very dangerous thing to do. And after the operation was done, they, they packed his mouth with, with cotton and uh, sailed on to uh, Buzzards Bay, which is where uh, Cleveland had his summer home on Cape Cod. Um, this is, I just like this picture. This is Dr. Keene in the operating room at, uh, at his medical college in, in Philadelphia, Jefferson Medical College. Uh, Keene is standing to, to the right there with his elbow that looks like propped up on the table. And I, I like how it, it looks like surgery was a spectator sport uh, back then with rows and rows of people just watching. Um, and it gives you some idea of, of, of what the state of surgery was at the time. I mean, really, it's, we, it seems very advanced to us, but it's kind of still a little medieval surgery at the time. I mean, they hadn't really figured out anesthesia quite as well as they, as they have today. They were just beginning to understand the principles of, of Lister, of, of, um, of, of sepsis, of, of sterilizing the instruments. And Keene was a firm believer in this. And so that's one reason there was no post-operative infection. Keene was very uh, keen to, uh, to sterilize all the instruments. And the, uh, the operation took place in, in, you know, considering the circumstances, a pretty sterile atmosphere. It took place below deck. Uh, they just tied a, a tied Cleveland down to a chair and some pillows behind his neck and uh, performed the, the operation below deck. It took place entirely within his mouth. Um, the operation, uh, actually, Keen used this, uh, this is a cheap retractor, the instrument on top is what it's called, and it, it allows the, uh, op the operating surgeon to pull the cheek back, and you can sort of cut away the inside a little bit, and that allowed the operation to be performed entirely within the mouth, and so there were no external scars to betray the, the secret that Cleveland had had the operation. That's a little uh, mirror uh, uh, that was also used in the operation. These, I should mention, these, uh, these are from the Lunar Museum in, in uh, Philadelphia, which is a great museum uh, of like odd medical stuff. And uh, Dr. Keene uh, donated a lot of his stuff to this museum, and you can see it there. Um, they also had a piece of, uh, a piece of the brain of, the, of a Gateau who uh, shot Garfield. So, and uh, Chief Justice John Marshall's bladder stones. Anybody interested? <laughs> um, but they have that too, so they were great, great weird stuff up there, and they, they were very, very nice uh, to let me photograph some of these, uh, uh, some of the instruments that we that we used. Um, Cleveland recovered amazingly quickly. Uh, there were rumors that he was in very poor health, uh, but they staged these events where he would go out fishing every day on Buzzards Bay. But they would keep the reporters far enough away. It reminds me of President Reagan and how he used to stand by the helicopter, and they couldn't hear the questions because oh, I don't know. I'm sorry, I answered your question. Uh, and that's what they did with Grover. Um, they, they kind of kept the reporters away and said, hey, look, he's out fishing. They had him fitted with a prosthetic device, uh, um, a, uh, a, a, a or, or, I have to write this down, an oturator, that's the technical name for an artificial jaw. Uh, a doctor came up and took a mold of the, of the cavity and then using vulcanized rubber fashioned a, a, a prosthetic uh, bit prosthesis that he could insert into his jaw. And once it was healed well enough, this took a couple of weeks, but once it was healed well enough and he put that in place, it restored the natural shape of his face, but more importantly, it restored his speaking voice. Uh, without this, he, he spoke and had a terribly uh, impeded speech. Uh, but once this device was in place, he was able to speak as well as he had before. It's really quite amazing and important to keeping up the secret. Um, the uh, the secret held, this is the tumor, by the way. Probably should have, this is the money shot. Should have saved this for later. But, uh, <laughs> but that's the tumor. The doctor who fashioned this uh, organized rubber uh, prosthesis um, ended up with the tumor somehow. Uh, I guess it's just a cool souvenir to show your friends when they come over. Uh, you'll never believe what I have. Um, and then it was donated also to the Moon Museum in uh, Philadelphia, which. Uh, um, which allowed me to photograph it. 
Uh, you, you can't really see much in there, but if you, if you look close, I think you can see a tooth. And mostly it's just a big blob. It kind of looks like cauliflower. It just starts sitting there. And uh, they're not sure what the preserving liquid is, um, but it seems fairly well preserved for being, you know, 120 years old. Um, it, it, the secret held on the operation until September of 1893. And that's when a, a reporter, a guy named E.J. Edwards, uh, there's Mr. Edwards, he was a reporter for the Philadelphia Press. What had happened was, one of the doctors on the boat had missed an appointment. Uh, he was the anesthetist, and he had an appointment to uh, deliver gas, to perform, uh, as, you know, deliver anesthesia for an operation the next day, but the boat got held up, and so he missed his appointment with a doctor in Greenwich, Connecticut, and he explained by saying, well, I was performing an operation on the President of the United States. I hope that's okay. And this was the first time that word started to filter out, especially among the medical community, among the doctors in New York, that something really quite serious had happened to the President. Uh, the cover story was a toothache, that the President had had a toothache. Um, and that, yes, some, he had a tooth removed on the boat, which technically is true, uh, but they didn't mention the other four teeth in the large cancerous mass that was also removed. So the cover story of the toothache really kind of held until September of 1893 when E.J. Edwards, who was a, really one of the first true investigative reporters uh, in American journalism, really deserves to be better remembered, uh, he, he tracked down the source of the story, who was a, a dentist named Hasbro, who was on the boat, and he was the guy who had missed the appointment and had, and, and had a, a told why. And he was able to confirm some of the details with Hasbro and then with other uh, people who were on the boat. And he published the story in, uh, in September of 1893 in the, in the Philadelphia Press, and the headline was, The President, a Very Sick Man. Uh, the reaction from the White House was immediate, and it was complete denial. And not only that, uh, the, the White House uh, not only denied that it was true that there had been a cancerous tumor removed from Cleveland's mouth, but they attacked the messenger. Uh, they called uh, uh, Edwards was a, a disgrace to journalism, a cancer faker. Uh, it was really pretty, pretty mean stuff uh, that they did. Grover had a reputation for honesty, ironically. I mean, it goes back to 1884 when he fessed up about the illegitimate child. And the public really sided with the president in this debate. And Edwards, who had told the truth, was, was uh, uh, cast as, as the villain, as the liar. Just a, a tool for the Republicans, they said, to, to make Cleveland look bad. And so basically, it was the scoop that nobody believed. And it hung over Edwards for the rest of his career. And it, it wasn't until many years later that he was finally vindicated. Uh, in 1917, uh, Keane, the doctor who had performed the operation, was the lead surgeon of the operation, decided to publish an account of it in the Saturday Evening Post of all places. Grover was long dead by then. He died in 1907. Uh, we're not sure what he died of. He might have had a, a, some. Uh, he might have had a, a cancer, uh, a, a cancerous tumor in his intestine, but nobody really knows. Um, but Keene decided that it was time for the truth to be told. And Keene did this to his credit, partly to vindicate Edwards, the reporter who had been vilified when he reported the truth, it was 24 years later. So Keene went to uh, uh, Frances Cleveland, the former First Lady, and got her permission to do this. Uh, Frances, by the way, she lived until uh, 1947. And she, she remarried after Grover died, uh, a, a Princeton professor named uh, Thomas Preston in her she became then, you know, Mrs. Frances Preston. And she was uh, attending a fancy dinner in the, in the 40s one time in, uh, in Washington. And she was seated next to Eisenhower, General Eisenhower. And her, but her place card just said, Mrs. Thomas Preston. And Eisenhower had no idea who this old lady was. And uh, they started uh, talking about Washington, and Washington, D.C. And, and uh, Frances mentioned that she had lived there once. And, and Ike said, really, where? <laughs> I think Francis really liked to sort of play that game with people that they, they, nobody would ever think that uh, the former First Lady was, uh, was among them. Um, but in any event, uh, uh, Keene published this report after getting Francis's consent in the, in the Saturday Evening Post in 1917. And uh, it was the first, first account, public account, authorized account of the, uh, of the operation ever here. And it did vindicate Edwards, uh, who was in his 70s at that time. 
and uh, he was very grateful to Keen uh, that his reputation was finally, uh, at long last, uh, restored. Um, it, it was a, a really kind of touching story, touching for me to read the, the letters, the correspondence between Keen and Edwards uh, later in life as they both, uh, you know, sort of reflected on their role in this very important but unknown uh, piece of American history. This is the first cast that was taken of the roof of Mount of uh, Cleveland's mouth by the dentist who fashioned the Obturator, uh, tour, the uh, prosthetic device that restored his, his face. And you, see, you can see the defect is pretty, it's a very long uh, defect there. And just to show you the remarkable healing, that's from 1893. This next one is 1897. And the defect has shrunk to just that little hole back there. So Grover would have to periodically go in and get a new, uh, a new device fashioned as the wound, uh, as the wound shrank, and uh, it, it, it worked until uh, until his very last breath. He wore it and uh, was able to um, able to uh, you know speak perfectly clear. I, I think it was must have been a total pain though because after, every time he ate, he would have to take it out, and clean it, clean the area behind it. It, it was a very cumbersome device. Um, but considering the alternative, which, you know, was to have this growth in your mouth, I guess it, it didn't look too bad. Um, Grover, as I said, lived until 1907. He retired to Princeton, New Jersey. Grover never went to uh, college. He studied law privately in Buffalo, became a lawyer, who was the last U.S. president to not attend college. Harry Truman. Yes, Truman. I have a book about Truman, too. Is that a coincidence? Um, <laughs> So here you see Grover at Princeton. He's got a little gaunt in his later years. It said that he, he, he had a short temper to begin with, and after the operation, it, it grew even shorter. And uh, some, some speculate that his response to the Pullman strike in Chicago uh, in 1894, during his second term, he sent federal troops to break a railroad strike in Chicago, that, that pre-Operation Grover might not have acted quite so rationally and harshly that he, uh, he, he just had less patience uh, after the operation. And as you can see, eventually after the operation, he, he did lose uh, quite a bit of weight. Um, he's buried in Princeton. That's, that's his grave on the left. Francis is on, is on the right. And uh, his grave does not mention the fact that he was president of the United States. You can see, I don't know if you can see, but laying on the, on the, the shelf of the grave there are a bunch of blades and stones. Uh, Grover is a, is a hero to Hawaiians. Uh, Grover uh, refused to recognize the government that overthrew the queen in Hawaii, uh, uh, with one of the sugar uh, trusts or, uh, organized a coup to overthrow the queen of Hawaii in, 18, in the 1890s. And uh, Grover refused to uh, recognize that. And so Hawaiians still regard Grover Cleveland very highly. And the Hawaiian students that come to Princeton uh, traditionally will go and lay uh, stones or shells on the grave uh, to remember Grover. Uh, but the tumor I mentioned, and, and, and you saw earlier, um, well here, magic of technology. Oh, there it is. Uh, the tumor sat in the, uh, at the Moore Museum for many years, and it, it really baffled uh, doctors exactly what kind of cancer uh, Grover had. And here was the tumor right there in the jar, easy enough to do some some tests on it and determine exactly what kind of cancer he had. Um, but again, going back to this thing where you, you know you think, you know, Grover's mom dead, who cares? Well, one of the rumors was that Grover had contracted syphilis, and that any test on the tumor would reveal whether or not he had syphilis. So the grandchildren refused to have the specimen uh, tested until 1980. Um, and so in 1980, finally, uh, they allowed it to be tested to determine what kind of tumor he had. And it turns out he didn't have the same cancer that Grant had. He had a, a, a different kind of cancer. It's called varicose carcinoma, BC. And, and it's a very slow growing, it's technically malignant, but it's very slow growing and generally does not metastasize. But the, but the recommended uh, treatment is exactly what Grover had, and that's completely excised the tumor. Um, they're very rare, and I talked to a pathologist, one of the a pathologist who worked on the study in Philadelphia, uh, who, who did the study on the tumor in 1980, and he's still a practicing pathologist in Philadelphia, and he said, besides Grover's, he's only seen one other case of this cancer. 
Um, I also like the idea that he has a file in Grover Cleveland as a patient uh, in his office. And uh, the, the test also conclusively determined whether or not uh, Grover had syphilis. And the answer to that is in the book, which is on sale back then. <laughs> so that's all I have. If uh, anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them.
one of the reasons Cleveland won his first race in, in 1884 is that when he was running against James G. Blaine, who was a, a speaker of the House from Maine, and uh, uh, at the very, very tail end of the campaign, one of uh, Blaine's supporters uh, was giving a speech and called uh, the Democrats the party of Rome, Romanism, and rebellion. You know, drunk, Catholic, and disloyal. And uh, the, the, the Republicans were frequently waving the bloody shirt, as they said, reminding voters of the Civil War. And when it came, uh, when Cleveland came to office, uh, a southern, I, I forget exactly which states, several states, requested that their battle flags, Confederate battle flags, be returned and in storage, uh, I presume at the Smithsonian in Washington. And uh, they wanted to have the flags returned to the states, and so Cleveland agreed to this, and it turned into a huge political mess for Cleveland because it made it look like he was sympathetic to the Confederacy. It didn't help that Cleveland did not serve in the Union Army uh, during the Civil War. He paid a, uh, he paid a Polish immigrant, uh, I forget what it was, $50, $500 to, to take his, to take his, sorry? 300 uh, to take his place, which was perfectly legal at the time, um, although it didn't look good. Uh, Cleveland had good reasons for doing it. He had two brothers who were serving in so He was the sole support for his mother and two of his sisters. Um, but that became an issue for him as well. That's one other question over there. Yeah. Um, what's the political reasons why he wasn't elected um, in, the, in between? Was something going on in the country? You know, no, not really. When it, it, it came down to me, the question was why didn't he get reelected in 1888 at, at in between term? And really, it came down to in, in 1884, uh, it came down to New York State, whoever won New York State. Uh, kind of like Florida's been in Ohio. If you won, if you won New York, you were going to win the electoral vote, and he won it by one percent in 1884, and in 1888 he lost it by one percent. So basically, literally, two thousand people changed their votes, and Benjamin Harrison became president. So it really wasn't a, a it wasn't even a, really a rejection of Cleveland as such, and, and that's why it's kind of it's, it's interesting he came back from. I mean, could you imagine that ever happening again? That, you know, Jimmy Carter in 84 ran against Reagan and beat him. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, oh, it's like, uh, Two questions. Number one, um, a very happy single man that makes it into the White House. I'm just curious why, uh, how to explain that. And second question is, why did you choose to live in the Ulan Butler, <laughs> Mongolia? First of all, a happy single man makes it to the White House. And why do I choose to live in Ulan Uh Every single man is happy. <laughs> I don't understand your question. Oh, happy, happy. Happy, happy. Oh, heavy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, we can edit this. That was a little show. Heavy, heavy. Uh, you know, uh, really, uh, the, the heavy thing wasn't a big issue back then. You know, a lot of rich people were heavy. And it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't considered a, a, a political drawback at all. Um, you know, it's one of those things. You, you could be, you could be heavy, and uh, you, one thing though, you had to have facial hair. There was nobody. I think uh, you can go from Lincoln to Taft, and every every single one has facial hair except McKinley, and we both have facial hair. Uh, I, I'm in Mongolia. My wife is a foreign service officer. Uh, she works for the State Department, and so uh, we're posted in Mongolia. She's an American diplomat. She's a public affairs officer at the embassy. So we'll post it there for three years for the middle of the tour. I checked the temperature this morning, it's minus 10 <laughs> in, uh, in Ulaanbaatar. So. Yeah. Did <clears throat> Cleveland try to exert influence on the 1896 nomination or convention of William James Bryan? Yeah, he, uh, uh, Cleveland hated William James Bryan, uh, he, but he didn't have much influence to wield at that point. Uh, he didn't have a lot of political capital to spend. He was, he was unpopular and he was also rather unhealthy. Uh, Cleveland, the Democrats voted us. There was a splinter ticket of uh, Democrat gold, gold Democrats in 1896. And so Cleveland supported the gold Democrat candidate and did not support uh, William Jennings Bryan. We have a question online about your next project. What's the, the subject of your next book? The next book? Um, uh, we were discussing this earlier. I committed myself to writing a, a series of non-best-selling books, and uh, I had a lot of luck with it. So, so I don't want to break the stream. Uh, the next one will be called The 
pedestrianism when watching people walk was America's national pastime. In the 1870s and 1880s, six-day walking matches organized by the Sunday Association were held in Madison Square Garden. In 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, 1880, midnight the following Saturday night for six days. And you couldn't walk on Sunday because it was the Sabbath. And so that was the longest you could go, but thousands of people would pour in, pay 25 cents each to just sit and watch people walk. And the second most popular sport must have been watching the grass grow. Well, I would say watching the grass grow is probably more interesting. <laughs> so I'm going to take this really boring thing and turn it into an exciting book. All right. <laughs> and only you can do it. Yeah. Well, Question, uh, where was Cleveland born? Oh, I don't know. Cleveland was born in Caldwell, New Jersey. His father was a Presbyterian minister, and he was born in the Nance, is that what you call it? The, where the parsonage, where the, the minister lives. So he was born in New Jersey. <coughs> and, uh, interesting, much like uh, Flagler, I think what was Henry was like 14 when he uh, left, home. left home. I think Rover was 16, and he left home. He wanted to go to Cleveland, which was then the big boom town. Cleveland was actually named for a distant relative, Moses Cleveland. Um, but he wanted to go to Cleveland, which was the big boom town, but only made it as far as Buffalo, where his uncle lived. And Buffalo at the time, it's hard to imagine, was really one of the most important cities in the country. It was where the Erie Canal met the Great Lakes. And so all commerce, everything moved through Buffalo. And so he figured this was a good place to try to find his way. And uh, he really liked the nightlife of Buffalo, too. He hung out around in the bars along Canal Street. And he really enjoyed it. That's where he really started to put on the weight. And he was the question of mine here, too. Before they got to know her, did the public have a problem with Francis being so young? Uh, before they got to know her, did the public have a problem with Francis as being so young? Yeah, not really. Um, I, I guess, if anything, it was Cleveland who would risk looking bad in that situation. I mean, he was 49 and she was 21, and I guess some people could say it looked like he was taking advantage of her, although they had had a relationship really throughout her lifetime. Um, and, and so people, uh, people really loved uh, Francis Cleveland. And I talk about it in the book a little bit. She was really one of the most beloved first ladies in American history. She was young and she was uh, vivacious, healthy. You have to remember the preceding first lady, uh, Benjamin Harrison's wife, had died and towards the end of his term. So it really hadn't had like this kind of young, vibrant. I mean, the comparisons to Jacqueline uh, to, you know, Kennedy are, are apt in this case. Uh, I mean, to have a and to have a first lady that, that's having children in, in the White House. Uh, the second daughter, Esther, was born in the White House, the only child of a president born within the White House itself. And, and so this was really fascinating in America, just at a time when America really was becoming to embrace celebrity culture in a way. Mass media were, were you know, made it possible for people to, uh, um, you know, to learn about celebrities. And, and, uh, and Francis was really a celebrity, maybe the first celebrity uh, first lady. And, and she served these two terms with him. Uh, you know, so she went away and came back. Uh, so that was that added to her mystique, I think, as well. There's one last question here. Uh, uh, in terms of the uh, of his uh, secrecy in his operation, how many people beyond the medical profession knew about this? I mean, I presume there was a White House staff of some sort that must have known that. Yeah, not very many. His uh, needed by the question was how many people outside the medical staff knew about the operation, knew about the cancer. Uh, his, his chief, his Secretary of War was a guy named Dan Lamont. He was also his de facto chief of staff, press spokesperson, and he knew and he helped organize it. Uh, Frances knew, uh, although she she played dumb through the whole thing. I mean, she was asked directly and several times by reporters and said, no, 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 he just went fishing. Uh, but most of the rest of the cabinet did not know. Stevenson heard the rumors. Stevenson, the vice president, was actually in Chicago attending the 1893 exposition uh, for the 4th of July. And, uh, you know, by the way, when he was on this operation, Cleveland was missing on the 4th of July. I mean, you know, hey, where's the president? I don't know. Uh, so Stevenson was sent to uh, Chicago to get in to uh, represent the president at the, at the exposition, the Columbian Exposition in 1893. And as soon as he got in, that something happened, Cleveland might be happening. He started heading east. Cleveland to send a telegram, actually Lamont sent a telegram to Stevenson, no, don't come back here, we don't need you. In fact, we'd like you to go meet 
with some Democratic Party officials in Seattle <laughs> in 1893. So that basically put Stevenson out of the picture for about six weeks. And uh, uh, the Attorney General, uh, only Richard Olney was the Attorney General at the time, he had no idea. And, uh, and Cleveland was to deliver a big speech about the silver issue, and he went up to uh, the home of Buzzards Bay and was, was stupefied, was shocked when he saw the condition that Cleveland was in, whereas this was before the prosthesis mouth was just packed with gauze and couldn't speak. So most of the most of the administration did not know uh, the real story. We have one more right there. Um, was there any intimation that what Cleveland ate or drank could have caused this? Yeah. Um, was there any intimation that what Cleveland ate or drank could have caused this? And in fact, um, alcohol and tobacco are contributing factors to this particular type, VC, varicose carcinoma. Um, are contributing factors, and uh, not only that, Cleveland, of course, was a heavy beer drinker, but he uh, he didn't uh, smoke cigars as much as chew them, and it was noted that this tumor was on the cigar chewing side of his mouth, and so he uh, it is thought that that may have been a contributing factor uh, to the cancer. Um, the cancer, if he did, by the way, they they speculate if he did die of a cancer, intestinal cancer, that it was not related to the oral cancer of 1893. One more to the right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, since this uh, operation was so successful on Cleveland using Blister's principles, did anything come about in the medical profession because it was such a successful operation on the Well, it's unfortunate really because by the time it became generally known, uh, the, the principles had been widely adopted by then. Uh, the publication of Keene's article in 1917, by then it was 24 years after. Um, and so Keene personally considered it uh, a very important demonstration of, of, the, of the principles. Um, but unfortunately, he wasn't able to publicize it. One of the questions was, why did Keene publish this story on the Saturday evening post of all places, you know, and not a medical journal? And I actually asked uh, Dr. O'Brien, uh, the uh, um, pathologist in Philadelphia, like, why do you think he, you know, put the article in the Saturday evening post instead of a medical journal? And O'Brien said, because he's a surgeon, he wanted to brag about it. Mm -hmm. You know, he wanted to tell the most people he possibly could about this amazing surgical success that they had had. But, but, but it didn't really uh, have much impact on that Mr. Series got pretty well accepted. The food, very interesting. Every traveler that you read about from the talk to Ilana comments on the gargantuan quantities of food that Americans consume. Yeah. There's a book on Delmonico's Restaurant, which I have on a while back. And when you look at the menus, the offerings, and the enormous quantities of, of, and variety of the foods, it tells you a lot about the thinking of the culture and the, the influence that that had on them. Yeah. The question is pointing out that we eat too much. <laughs>
uh, the, the uh, World's Colonial Exposition. I want to thank all of you for being here today and thank those, the 10% of us who joined us via the internet. Um, I hope to see you all here next week, or yes, next week for our final, fifth and final lecture in the series on Rutherford B. Hayes. And one more thank you to the Max and Victoria Bryce Foundation and Palm Beach Post for helping to make this possible. Thank you all. Thanks.